Happy Sabbath and welcome to Bible study. Our series is entitled Jesus or Sanctuary and we have been reading along in the book The Cross and Its Shadow by S. N. Haskell. Today we look at chapter 28, The Feast of Trumpets. This is the first chapter in a new section, which is section 7, which deals with the feasts in the autumn. The proper title is the Autumnal Feast. After this chapter 28, and why do you pay attention to these next chapters coming up? Because they are of great importance for us today. Chapter 29 is the Day of Atonement or the work in the second apartment. Chapter 30 is Duty of the Congregation on the Day of Atonement. Chapter 31 will be the nature of the judgment. And finally, we will end with chapter 32, the Feast of Tabernacles. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us this another blessed Sabbath day. I pray as our hearts are turned to you that we will find our peace. Yes, there is turmoil all around. There are questions and Answers are needed for those questions, Lord. But we know that many of the answers we will not have in this world. We will have to wait for that time when we will sit with you as we look at the books of records in heaven. But for now, comfort our hearts with the knowledge that you are coming soon. And bless us as we open your words in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sprinkled throughout the book, The Cross and the Shadow, we find at the end of each section or the beginning, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, a poem is inserted. And I wanted to read this poem uh, that is right in front of or right before of this, this new section. And it's called The Sprinkled Blood. The sprinkled blood is speaking before the Father's throne. The Spirit's power is seeking to make its virtues known. The sprinkled blood is telling Jehovah's love to man, while heavenly harps are swelling sweet notes to mercy's plan. The sprinkled blood is speaking forgiveness full and free. Its wondrous power is breaking each bond of guilt for me. The sprinkled blood's revealing a father's smiling face. The Savior's love is scaling each monument of grace. The sprinkled blood is pleading its virtues as my own, and there my soul is reading her title to thy throne. The sprinkled blood is owning the weak one's feeblest plea, mid sighs and tears and groaning, it pleads, O Lord, with thee. And this poem is anonymous. Let us avail ourselves of the virtues of the power of the sprinkled blood of Christ. We have seen how there are many offerings and sacrifices that are given. And the one that we can most identify with is the sacrifice of the sin offering. When we sin and we present the blood of Christ before the Father, we are assured that we have forgiveness. Just consider what this means for us. God himself became human in the human flesh so that he could, through this human flesh, have his blood shed so that by that shed blood, we sinners here in this year, 2020, we could still plead, Father, forgive us. And the Father sees the spilt blood of his Son, and he says, yes, you have my pardon. The trumpet was not only used as a musical instrument among the ancient Israelites, but it also filled an important place in their religious and civil ceremonies. 
It was associated with the entire life of the children of Israel. It was used on their joyful days and on their solemn days. And at the beginning of every month, it was sounded over their burnt offerings and their peace offerings. It was to be a reminder to the Israelites of the Lord their God. Numbers 10.10 Also in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. In obedience to the command of God, Moses made two silver trumpets to be used in calling their assemblies and in regulating the journeyings of the children of Israel. Make thee two silver, make thee two trumpets of silver, we're told in Numbers 10, verse 2. Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeyings of the camps. When the priests blew the trumpets, all the people were to assemble at the door of the tabernacle. If one trumpet sounded, only the princes or the leaders responded. We read uh, Numbers 10, verse 3 and onward. And when they shall blow with them, meaning both trumpets, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When ye blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east parts shall go forward. When ye blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. The call for summoning to the religious assemblies was different from the sound of an alarm, which was blown to gather the army for war. God promised that when they blew the alarm for war, they should be remembered before the Lord and should be saved from their enemies. And we read this Numbers 10 onward. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. In the time of Solomon, great skill was shown in the blowing of trumpets, so that the notes from 120 trumpets came forth as one sound. Second Chronicles 5.12 also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar. And with them an hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. It came, to, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. May this be to us like a symbol uh, a shadow of what it means 
for us as believers to come together as one and with one voice to proclaim the messages of our Lord's salvation. May we be able to come together as one voice as we make decisions in the work of the Lord. When God wished to gather the hosts of Israel at the base of Mount Sinai to listen to the proclamation of his holy law, from the midst of the glory of the Lord that covered the mountain, the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud was heard, and the people trembled. And as the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and it became louder and louder, even Moses, that holy man of God, said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And that's our text here from Exodus 19, verses 16, 19, and also from Hebrews 12, 21. And we read Exodus 19, verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And verse 19 of Exodus 19, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And finally, Hebrews 12, 21, And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. God designed that every blast of the trumpet blown by his people, whether it's for joy or for sorrow, for worship or for war, should be a memorial or reminder of the power of God to comfort, sustain, and protect his people. That they may be to you, he said, for a memorial before your God, I am the Lord your God. And we see that in the latter part of Numbers 10.10, 10, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. See, God is constantly trying to remind us but by different avenues, by our senses, showing us of his love and his constant care for us. Every child of God having full faith in the promises who went forward and blew the trumpets in obedience to God's command, beheld the deliverance of the Lord, whether confronted by obstacles as high as the walls of Jericho or by enemies as numerous as the hosts of Midian. And we're going to read the account now of, um, of Jericho in Judges chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass or circle the city seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And now verse 5. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when he hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And we read now of Gideon, Judges 7, verses 19 and 20. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came onto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Continuing, And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the hosts ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets. And the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the host fled to Beth Shitta, into Zerera, and to the border of Abel Meholah, unto Tabath. 
And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. When the sound of the trumpet was often heard by the children of Israel, while yet, let me read that again. While the sound of the trumpet was often heard by the children of Israel, yet there was one day in each year especially set aside for the purpose of blowing the trumpets. Of this day the Lord said, as we read in Numbers 29 and verse 1, And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. Each month of the year ushered in with the sound of the trumpet, and eleven sacrifices were offered. On the first day of the seventh month, in addition to the eleven offerings slain, the first of each month, ten other sacrifices were offered. And we read that here in uh, Numbers 28, verse 11 and onwards. And in the beginnings of your months ye shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord, two young bullocks and one ram, seven lambs of the first year without spot, and three tenth deals of flour for a meat offering, mingled with oil for one bullock, and two tenth deals of flour for a meat offering, mingled with oil for one ram, and a several tenth deal of flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, unto one lamb for a burnt offering of a sweet savour and a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. And their drink offerings shall be half an hin of wine unto a bullock and a third part of an hin unto a ram and a fourth part of an hin unto a lamb. This is the burnt offering of every month throughout the months of the year. And one kid of the goats for a sin offering unto the Lord shall be offered beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. In other words, that's a Sabbath day. Continuing with verse 2. And ye shall offer a burnt bullock for a sweet savour unto the Lord. One young bullock, one ram, seven lambs of the first year without blemish. And their meat offering shall be of flour mingled with oil, three tenth deals for a bullock, and two tenth deals for a ram, and one tenth deal for one lamb throughout the seven lambs. And one kid of the goats for a sin offering to make an atonement for you, beside the burnt offering of the month, and his meat offering, and the daily burnt offering, and his meat offering and their drink offerings according unto their manner for a sweet savour, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. Leviticus 23, 24. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. So the day was kept as a ceremonial or annual Sabbath, and was one of the seven days of holy convocation connected with the annual feast. The Feast of Trumpets was a memorial. Some have thought it to be a memorial of the creation of the world as it was celebrated at the year's end or revolution of the year and might have been a memorial of the time when all the sons of God shouted for joy at the creation of the world. Exodus 34, 22, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. We read the text now from Job, which speaks of the, um, the morning stars gathering together and celebrating. It says here, Job 38, verse 4 to 7, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? 
or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Dr. William Smith says, the Feast of Trumpets came to be regarded as the anniversary of the birthday of the world. This, this William Smith is none other than uh, the author of Smith's Bible Dictionary. It is quite evident that, like the Passover, the Feast of Trumpets was both commemorative and typical. It came on days before the Day of Atonement, the type of the great investigative judgment, which opened in 1844 at the end of the long prophetic period of the 2300 years of Daniel 814. We're going to go into this a bit more. So we're seeing that there, the Feast of Trumpets came before the Day of Atonement. It announced the approaching of the Day of Atonement. Feast of Trumpets, there is a loud proclamation saying, listen, the Day of Judgment is about to come. Spoken of here, Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We went into that in detail in the previous study. In the type, the trumpets were blown throughout Israel, warning all of the near approach of the solemn day of atonement. In the antitype, the reality now, we should expect some worldwide message to be given in trumpet tones, announcing the time near when the great antitypical day of atonement, the investigative judgment, would begin in the heavens. We read Daniel 7 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fire flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were opened. Beginning with the years 1833 to 1834 and extending down to 1844, such a message was given to the world in trumpet tones announcing the hour of his judgment is come. We read Revelation 14.6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. William Miller and others, in their study of the declaration in Daniel 8, 14, which says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, found that this long prophetic period would end in 1844. They failed, however, to connect this text with the ancient typical sanctuary, but applied the term sanctuary to this earth and taught that in 1844 Christ would come to the earth to cleanse it and judge the people. William Miller was joined by hundreds of other ministers in America who proclaimed his message with great power. Edward Irving, with many other consecrated men, preached the same message in England, while Joseph Wolfe and others heralded the same message in Asia and other portions of the world. During the ten years before the tenth day of the seventh Jewish time, in 1844, every civilized nation on the earth heard in trumpet tones the announcement of the message of Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. The hour of his judgment is come. This message was due at this period of the world's history. Paul, 
in his day preached of a judgment to come. When he said here in Acts 24, 25, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. So we see that during Paul's day, he spoke of judgment to come. But then the message we just looked at, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, tell us that the hour of his judgment is come. Is come, not to come. Is come. So the burden of the message given in these years, 1844, the hour of his judgment is come. The fact that the men who proclaimed this message misunderstood the full import of it did not prevent their fulfilling the antitype of the ancient time. So in other words, because they didn't understand what it was that they were preaching, the full import they lost sight of one portion of the prophecy. They thought the earth was a sanctuary. The message they gave was accurate. 100% accurate, just as it was with John the Baptist. John the Baptist preached about Jesus coming as someone who is more worthy than he himself was. He knew that this would be the Messiah. But yet, he still had that doubt, which is why he sent his disciples to question Jesus, are you the person who was to come or not? But John the Baptist's message, his work was valid and Jesus gave the stamp to it by saying that there had never been a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So it was for William Miller and the preachers in his day who were teaching or sharing this message, the hour of God's judgment is come. When the followers of Christ died, cried, before him, all right, when they, they went forward and, and they, they cried out, um, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they spread palm branches in the way, believing that Jesus was entering Jerusalem to take the earthly kingdom. They fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, Thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So that was a prophecy. We see its fulfillment in Luke 19, verses 35 to 40. And they brought him to Jesus and they cast their garments upon the colt and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. If they had known that in a few days their Lord would hang upon the accursed tree, they could not have fulfilled the prophecy for it would have been impossible for them to rejoice greatly. Galatians 3.13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So you see, they had to fulfill the prophecy of their king coming on a lowly colt. They fall of an ass, they had to exercise the triumphal entry of the king of peace. If it was open to their understanding that Christ would die shortly thereafter, their rejoicing and celebrating would be hollow. They would not 
fully believe what they were doing. So it was in 1833 and onwards until 1844, the ministers were preaching the message of the soon coming of Christ, not recognizing that there was a difference between the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary. In like manner, the message due to the world, and I'm going to emphasize it again, between 1834 and 1844 could never have been given with the power and joyfulness demanded to fulfill the antitype. If those giving it had understood that the Savior, instead of coming to this earth, was to enter the most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary and begin the work of the investigative judgment, God hid from their eyes a fact that there were two other messages to be given to the world before the Lord should come to the earth in power and glory. And we're going to look at those messages now. Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and tongue and kindred and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory for, to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So that was the first angel. The second angel is here shown to us in verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Verse 9, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Jesus could not come until they had fulfilled the antitype. Then, to comfort them in their disappointment, he allowed them by faith to look within the heavenly sanctuary and catch a glimpse of the work of their great high priest officiating for them. And we read that here in Revelation 11 verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake, and a great hail. The prophet Joel evidently connected the closing work of the gospel on earth with the blowing of the trumpets, for he writes as follows in Joel 2, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. The sound of trumpets was heard many times in the past, from the trumpet of the Lord's host upon Mount Sinai, when the whole earth shook, to the blast of the ram's horns before the walls of Jericho. Exodus 19.18 and then Hebrews 12.26 and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice in Hebrews twelve twenty six whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. The time is coming when the trumpet of the Lord will again be heard by mortals, 
when its notes will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. The clear notes of that trumpet will penetrate the deepest recesses of the earth, and just as anciently, the trumpet summoned all Israel to appear before the Lord, so every child of God sleeping in the earth will answer the trumpet call and come forth to meet his Lord. In old ocean's caverns, the clarion tones will be heard, and the sea, obedient to the call, will give up the dead that are in it. Revelation 20 verse 13 reads, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. The whole earth will respond with the tread of the innumerable company of the redeemed, as the living and the resurrected saints gather to meet their Lord in answer to the summons of the last trumpet call that will be given on this sin-cursed earth. Then all the discordant notes will forever cease, and the redeemed will hear the Savior say, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In the ancient typical service, as the people of God met for worship at the beginning of each month and upon the Sabbath, in obedience to the clear notes of the silver trumpets, in like manner, we can imagine that when the earth is made new, and from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, the redeemed assemble to worship before the Lord, it will be in response to the notes of the heavenly trumpets, of which those used in the ancient service were but a type. Isaiah 66, 22, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed, so shall your children, and your name, or your character, your reputation, remain. And it shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. I pray that as we have followed along in this study, I pray, please, take the time to look at the scripture passages. Rewind, go through this for yourself. Prove it whether it be true or false. Hold to that which is true. May we listen to the cry of this day and age. The trumpet started sounding 1844, the hour of his judgment has come. There is a message today that is a very message of the third angel to beware of the mark of the beast. May we use this time to search our hearts, to search out and to reach out after God be united with him. For the trumpet will again be heard in clear tones to shake this world when he shall come. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for showing us these things so that we know you You maintain a connection with us. You, you, you reach out to our senses, Lord, continually. We see that in the service of the sanctuary, you use different methods, different ways of reaching us. By our eyes, Father, we, we, we could see the light, the glory coming from the most holy apartment. We could see the pillar of cloud and of fire. We could see the shed blood. We could see the white linen worn by the priests. Father, we could smell the sweet incense we could smell the baking of the bread. Father, we could handle the sacrificial lamb and the knife. And Father, our ears hear the sound of the trumpet. 
So Lord, you bring the entire human experience before you and you speak to us through our senses. May our hearts respond to you in surrender and obedience. Accept us now, forgive us now, and lead us on so that the, when that trumpet shall sound, we will answer and say, this is our God. In Jesus' name, amen.